Order is important. Order is important. The ordering of things is vital, consequential, key. The sequence of things is crucial. What comes first, what comes second, then what's next. The arrangement, the progression is is no small matter. These are important things. So for instance, brushing your teeth. Brushing your teeth. You know, the order isn't you brush your teeth and then you eat dinner or second dinner and then like late night snacks and then go to bed. We know that's not the ordering. That's the ordering my kids think is the ordering. But that's not, that's not how it works, right? You, you eat and then you brush your teeth and, and then you go to bed. Obvious, right? Instinctive, intuitive. At least, at least it should be. Uh, there's an intuitive ordering to most things in life. So another... A powerful example, um, your pajamas, right? Your pajamas. You, you, you woke up this morning instinctively. You're like, I should change out of my pajamas before I go to church, right? That's the ordering. You don't come to church and then change out of your pajamas here at church, right? Silly, silly inane examples. But I think we could all think of many serious examples about the importance of ordering, I was on a number of planes over the holidays, and there's a a very important ordering, right? So safety checks and system checks before you take off, right? That's a good ordering. You don't want to flip those. You don't want to do the takeoff and then the safety or systems checks. Stoplights or um, stop signs, you know, there's an ordering to that. You see the sign, you stop, you assess traffic. And then you move forward. You don't want to flip the order of that. It's just simply, simply not wise. Or let's, let's move to some blue collar area here. How about uh, electricity? I have some electricians in the house. Um, when you're replacing a fixture, you generally don't start to take it off the wall and then start to unwire the wire nuts and grab hold of those bare copper wires and then go and then you turn the breaker off, right? That's not the right flow, right, Kenny? That's not how it goes, right? You, you, you don't do that. You flip it, right? You turn the power off and then you do all the other steps. Uh, plumbing, you don't just cut into a live, uh, highly pressurized water pipe. You turn the water off and things will go well for you. Order, sequencing, It's really important. We can think of countless examples. Countless examples abound. Marriage and sex, for instance. Cosmically ordered, a cosmically ordered sequence. But I get ahead of myself. That's where we're going to go a little bit next week with our text. Order. It's important. So much of the pain and dysfunction in our world comes from a tragic misordering of things. So for most things, we get the ordering right, but there's some things that we simply don't. We chronically misorder a number of things, get them completely, completely backwards. And this is what we do with what you could call religion, right? In our sinful and and darkened state, we invert things. We get them upside down. We get them completely backwards. So we mix up the sky for the ground. We call good evil. We call evil good. We call things love that are emphatically not love. And so it's this misordering of things that that Paul addresses when he writes to the church of, of Colossae. Colossae is a town in Asia Minor. There's a church there. There's a bunch of bad teaching that is swirling around in the community. There's some people who are saying things about these things you must do when it comes to food and things you must do when it comes to holidays and feast days. And if you do the right things, then you'll be approved. Then you'll be accepted. And Paul says, this, this is not how it, it goes. We need to make sure the ordering is right. So here is the core misordering that was troubling Colossae. And here is the core misordering that is troubling our world. Here's the core misordering that has troubled our world for eons and is also misordering our, our own homes and our own hearts. And it's simply this. You could, you could phrase it like this or write it like this. It's that... You do in order to be, that there's doing and then being. Let me explain further. So let's add to that. So you do good in order to then 
be loved or to be accepted. There is a command, there is the, the law, there is an imperative. Um, we're going to talk about two words, imperative and indicative. An imperative means you must do something. You must do something. It's imperative that you follow this command. And then indicative, think of the word like indicates. It, in, indicative means something's done and it indicates what's happened. So in other words, it's like you must do this in order for this state to come about. You must do these things in order to be now this. And this is a fundamental misordering in our world. In other words, this is how religions work. In general, you do good things and then you get a good response from the one or the ones that, that save you. So think of the, the old analogy, the stairway to heaven. Religions function by a stairway to heaven. It's rooted on earth and it goes up to the divine and you step by step do what is good or do what is acceptable and you, you earn your way into love and acceptance. And maybe that's what you've walked into this church thinking is like, I'm going to go to church and I'm going to be told the things to do and if I do the right things, then I'll be loved and then I'll be accepted and then I'll be a part of the club and I'll be a part of the circle. That is emphatically not the gospel. This is not the wild good news that we find in the scriptures. See, it's reversed. The stairway is there, but its foundation is in heaven, and it comes to earth. God is the one who does the marvelous things. Jesus is the one who walked that stairway, who came down and, and did for us what we could not do. He loved us. And now it's out of that love that we love others. So it's, it's the flip. It's being leads to doing. It's, it's being loved leads to now and empowers doing good. It's the indicative. Jesus has done these things. These things are done. They're accomplished. This is the good news of what has happened. Now in light of that, we are called to live this other way. So you can see it's, it's a flip. And the Apostle Paul who wrote the book of Colossians, is working time and time and time again to help his hearers and readers rightly reorder their world because our, the operating system of the soul is flipped upside down and backwards and is just, it has this muscle memory. It's like, I have to do this in order to be accepted and loved. I have to earn this. And Paul says, we need to rightly see the world. And as we launch into this year, we need to go back to this basic, fundamental understanding of the order of the gospel and what it means to be saved. So the Apostle Paul, uh, by the way, apostle means someone who's sent. So this Apostle Paul is sent by Jesus into the world to tell people the good news of, of who Jesus is. And Colossians is a letter that he wrote to this church. He didn't plant the church, but an associate of his did, and he knows that there's all this bad teaching. And so he's writing to write side things. And it's simple, this pattern that he's going to teach us. It's, it's really simple, but it's really revolutionary, and it'll help us read many of the books of the Bible. So in general, here's how Paul's communication works. Behold Jesus. Look at Jesus. Look what he's done. He's come to this earth. He's lived this life. Uh, he, he died this death and he, he was resurrected and he's ascended on high and now he sent his spirit. Here's what he's done and he's brought you to life now in accordance with that live this way. So behold Jesus. Look at Jesus and live and now live in light of this Jesus. So that's his, his main pattern. And then when he says live this way, how to live in the kingdom, he generally gives positives and negatives. He, he says, take off what's evil. Put off what's evil. Mortify. Kill your sin. And then he says, put on what is good. Put on what is righteous. Put on love. So take off evil and put on good. And you can do that because you're empowered by what he has done. That's the order and that's the flow. And so Colossians and, for instance, the book of Ephesians, another book that Paul wrote, um, they're really good examples of this. Both of those books you can divide in half. Take the number of chapters, divide them in half. The first few chapters are the indicative. Here's what Jesus has done. All the done stuff is there. 
Then the second half is the imperative. Now, in light of what he's done, do these things. Okay? So Colossians is the same. We're going to focus on chapter 3, but let me show you just a brief overview of the book. Chapters 1 and 2 of Colossians focus on what's been done. Here's the good news of who Jesus is and what he's done. And then chapters 3 and 4 shift focus to now what to do. Now, it's not as cleanly separated as that. Paul is constantly reweaving what Jesus has done with our call to live in the kingdom. He's constantly weaving those, but the focuses of, the, of these chapters are as such. So n- let me show you how this works out in our text today, okay? This is the pivot where we move from the what's been done to what to do now. So chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. If then you have been raised with Christ... Seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. If then, if then, here is the transition from chapter 2 to to chapter 3 and and chapter 4 of the imperative here. If then. Well, if then what? Well, if all the stuff that he's been talking about in chapter 1 and chapter 2, if all the stuff that Jesus has done is, is real and, and it's true and he's brought you to life and, and he's breathed his breath and he's, he's, he's washed you with his grace, if those things, well, then walk this way. Live this way. So here's what I'd like to do just really briefly. I want to turn to chapter 1 and I'm going to list... A, a number of these things that Jesus has done, and then we're going to do the same with chapter 2 in order to understand what's happening in chapter 3. So chapter 1, verses 15 through 22, he holds up these glowing truths about Jesus, and I'll, we'll just move through these quickly and let, let them make an impression on your head and your heart. Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Jesus is God in the flesh, in muscle and bone. Verse 16, For by him all things were created, all things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. What does this mean? Well, it means he's the creator. The creator has stepped into his creation and, and all things. There, there's not anything that you can think of that hasn't been created, that was ultimately created through him and ultimately for him. Verse 17, he's before all things. In him all things hold together. He was before all this existed. He didn't just come late in time and, and appear and, and start existing. He always was. And there's this quest in this world to figure out all, you know, the strong force and, and the, the weak force and how all the things hold together. He is the one who holds all existence together. Verse 18, he is the head of the body of the church. He is, he is the authority. He is the one we, we worship. He is the one who has made us as his people. Verse 18, he's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. He was the first one to to be resurrected from the dead in this way that we all now will be resurrected from the dead. We have resurrection life because of him. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Verse 20, through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. All the things that are broken, the alienations, the the divorce of things that, that should be together, all the scattered fragments of reality, he, he reconciles and he does it by making peace by the blood of his cross, going to the cross so justice could happen and mercy could be meted out, dying our due death. Verse 21 through 22, he's talking to all humanity and you, when well, he's talking to the believers, all, and you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. He is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. In other words, before Jesus, you were alienated 
from, from your creator. Before Jesus, you, you were torn apart from the source of love and hope and joy and peace. But now we are reunited because of who Jesus is. He has drawn us into the family. We are adopted because of his work. And then verse 27. God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. In other words, Paul's saying, look, it's this salvation, this incredible eternal life isn't just for a little club of you guys. This is for all hu- humanity, every tribe, tongue, and nation, for everyone who trusts in Jesus and the hope of glory that this creation has grown towards and, and, and leaned towards is this incredible truth that the Spirit of God would reside in his people and he would draw us into the very life of God and we would dwell with him and he would dwell with us and we would live in that perfect love for all eternity. And he has accomplished all these things. So that's just chapter 1. Again, in chapter 2, he turns our eyes to what has been done. Verse 9, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Verse 10, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Verse 11, in him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. That one might sound super weird to you. What he's talking about is that that he has cut away from our heart and our being that which is is wrong, that which is is, is evil. And he's he's purifying us and sanctifying us or uh, making us more like him. Verse 12. Having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. So we died with Jesus. For those who have entrusted in him by by the grace to do so, the old person in us, the one who who had constant selfish thoughts and constant dark and evil ways, that old person has died. That old man or that old woman in us has died. And now we rise to new life with him, which is what the next verse says. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. We were given a new nature. Our old hearts of stone have become hearts of flesh, and we're forgiven, given a whole new life. Verse 14, how does he do this? Well, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with his legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to a cross. That whole list of our guilties, guilty, 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 was nailed to his cross. And he's released us and freed us. Justice has been meted out and mercy bleeds out on his people. And then verse 15, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. In other words, all the forces of this world, the darkness, the evil, the injustice, the sin, and the death, He's conquered them. They could not hold him. And so all the guilt and, and, and all the shame and all the bondage and slavery, it's all overcome. All these things have been accomplished. All this doing has been done by Jesus. And so those are the first two chapters. And then Paul says this in chapter 3. If then, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above So if these things are the case, my friends, then if God's loving grace has brought you from death to life and darkness to light and you are restored and you are redeemed, then respond out of of love. Live the following way. Call and response. It's it's, it's call and response, like like good jazz or like good blues, right? There's there's this call and response. God calls us first. He is, is the divine initiator. He calls and we respond. And we live in light of what he's done. So, he's changed our identity. He's given us our, our identity. We are children of God by his, his grace. And so this brings me to the topic of identity. Um, so a word here on identity. I don't think I'm going to have to convince you of this. Our culture is an identity-obsessed culture. Hop on and scroll for two minutes or turn on the news or, or, over listen, or overhear a conversation. Don't like listening, but overhear a conversation at a, at a coffee shop. 
And you're going to hear this, this obsession with identity. I identify as whatever. I am this. I'm part of this political party. This is my tribe. We are constantly trying to create and curate identities for ourselves. And in this, this pursuit of creating an identity, architecting an identity, we've reduced identity to a, a myriad of things. We've, we've reduced identity to our sexuality. We've reduced identity to a gender. We've reduced identity to a political party, identity politics. We reduce identity to a profession or to our physicality, to our net worth or our cultivated social media presence. We reduce it to these things. So why? Why do we labor to create identities? Because there's this deeply held belief that if, if we curate a good enough identity, we will be loved and accepted. And this is a, a core operation of the soul to be loved and to be accepted, to be truly known and loved and accepted. This is a core operation of the soul. And so if we cobble together a savvy enough identity, then this group over here with these people will think I'm good enough and they'll, they'll accept me and I will have justified my meaning on planet Earth. But there's a problem with that, a really big problem. That's not how identity works. Identity is given. It's gifted. And yes, it has to do with community, but the, the primary community that gives us our identity is the Trinity, our triune God who created us. Who we are is found in our essence which comes from our origin, from our God. Our true humanity is found in knowing who God is and living in right relationship with him. And any attempt to exile God in our identity creation quest is really, really inane. It's, it's really broken. It's like, it's like a toddler who says, Mom, Dad, I don't need you. I figured out how to open the refrigerator. Right? It's like, I can open this, I can get what I want when I want it. The problem is that refrigerator wouldn't run if the parents weren't there, and there wouldn't be food in that refrigerator for the toddler to take out if the parents haven't provided that. More so, that child wouldn't exist if the parents' love hadn't brought them into existence. So as we try to create identities based on the things that we do while exiling our creator God, all we're going to be doing is, is piecemealing these broken identities together. And none of these identities that we put together, none of these identities that we architect, whether it's, it's CEO or, or athlete or the smart one or, or the pretty one or the, the poet, lover, influencer, whatever, none of these, if it, if it doesn't have in Christ at the very foundation, none of them is strong enough. And none of them is sound enough to bear the weight of your soul because you are an image bearer of the infinite and eternal God. So first we need to know who we are by knowing whose we are and knowing that identity that we have become these beloved children of God because of Jesus. Then we now fill our mind with the reality and remind ourselves of the reality of who we are and how we are to live, to think upon the things that are above so when you go back to Colossians 3, verses 1 through 2 here, he says, Seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. That's, that's a ruling metaphor, a kingly metaphor, at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that are above, not on things that are on earth, that are on the earth. In other words, give your attention to Jesus, who rules and who ru reigns over everything. Not simply because we're supposed to, but because that's, that's the very design of, of thought and intention and affection is, is to think upon our king and to live in accordance with his rule and reign. Like, you don't put gasoline in your car because you read the manual and it says put gas in your car. You put the gas in your car because it's designed to function and go off of that fuel. We are to give our attentions to how God has ordered the universe and, and who he is 
Because that's what we're wired for, to live in the wonder and the glory and the splendor of who he is. And so we are called to think in these things that are above. So we are to seek these things that are above. Uh, this word here, it's a fun word, zateo. You can see it up there in, in the brackets. Uh, this is a present tense word, which means it should be translated keep seeking. Keep on doing this. This is a continual and constant way of being. So orient yourself to reality. Calibrate yourself over and over daily to the reality of the kingdom of heaven. He also says, set your minds, phroneo. This is also present tense. In other words, you live in this. This is constant and continual. And this, this isn't just having a thought. This, is, this word means a pattern of thought or a habit of a mind. This is your mind, your will, and your emotions all bound up in how you um, interface with reality. And, and so I like to think of it as, as how you imagine reality to be. If you think reality, if you imagine reality to be this way, well, then you live in accordance with that. If I do this, then this happens. Here's the reality, so I will live in accordance with it. So, in other words, he's saying, tune your mind to how to live in this world um, as though the kingdom of heaven is ruling and reigning over all of it, because that's the case. Jesus is Lord. Now, quick thing. Um, we can mistranslate this or misunderstand this and go, oh, see? See, we're supposed to think about these things ah, and all this, this earthy stuff. I don't have to really mess with this. That's just for, for earthly people. You know, like a job and, and budgets and changing diapers and changing tires and, and, and doing all the ordinary things in your life. Like, ah, we shouldn't do that stuff. And then we become, you know, so heavenly minded that we're not any earthly good, right? That's not what Paul's talking about. He's not saying, don't do those things. He's referring back earlier in this letter where he talks about the elementary principles of this world. In other words, there's an earthy way. That's wrong. Earthy is good. There's an earthly way. There's an earthly way to understand how the world works. He says, don't go by those principles of, of you do this and, and you earn God's love and, and working your way. Don't, don't live that way. Live in the principles and the virtues of the kingdom of heaven and do all the diaper changing and tire changing and going to work and, and budgets and talking to your neighbor. Do all of those things under the heavenly principles and all the things will start to connect and the bones will go into socket. Live that way. So when he says think on the things above, he's talking about the realities of the kingdom of heaven that are over and underneath and throughout this existence of ours. So don't live by the principles and values of Silicon Valley. Don't live by the principles and values of radical individualism or consumerism or, or the American dream. But live by the values and principles of the kingdom of heaven. And we're to fill our minds with the truth of the kingdom of heaven. Right? This is why one of our key apprenticeship practices is scripture meditation. Because we believe scripture is is God's, reveal, God's self-revelation. He's revealed himself through Scripture and ultimately through Jesus, and Scripture points us to Jesus. And so we fill our minds and, and our hearts and our being with the truth of who he is and what he's done. And, and this is no secret. It's no secret that what we fill our heads and our hearts with, it affects how we live, right? It affects how we live. So uh, imagine over the holidays you're invited to a holiday party. And because you're, you're really punctual and a little OCD, you get there early. Um, and there's two other people. You don't know them, and you just you start talking with them. Within the first few minutes, it's really easy to tell which one of these people lives in front of a television watching CNN, and which one of them lives in front of a television watching Fox News. Or pick BBC, whatever. Like, pick, pick the channels. Because what they've imbibed, they start to, to leak out. The mantras come out. The way of thinking about the world leaks out. They've been formed. They have been shaped by what they are intaking, by what their attentions and time is attuned to. You've heard us say it, and we're going to say it again and again. We become like what we behold. Another way to say that is we are shaped by what we intake and what we contemplate. We are shaped by what we intake and what we 
contemplate? Are we taking in the broken principles of this world? Or are we taking in the reality of the kingdom of heaven? We have these neuroplastic minds. Our minds have this neuroplasticity. They shift and they change over time. And God has given us wooable hearts. Things try to woo us and change us and transform us. What are we paying attention to? What are we paying attention to? What are we giving our time and attention to? Are we living in the scriptures? Are we living in the scriptures? And are we then visiting the news feeds? Or have we spent our money to buy a massive plot of land and build a huge home in the news cycle and every once in a while we visit the scriptures kind of like it's a coffee shop that we go to every now and then for comfort. What do we live in and what are we visiting? Because it shapes us. It forms us. And Paul says, seek the things that are above. Spend your time and your talents to, to envision the world as it is. Now, Paul appeals here again to our true identity, so he roots this action of seeking in the gospel. Look at verses 3 through 4. So he says, seek, set your minds. But then he goes right back to what, what Christ has done. For you have died, and your life is hidden, crypto, hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So check this out. Like, Look at how intentional Paul is by framing or in framing all that we do with what Christ has done. So if this has happened, that's the done indicative, that's what Jesus has done, then do this. Then he goes back to what's been done, and then it goes to the outcome. In other words, all our doing is bracketed and framed by what Jesus has done. Paul's obsessed with going, ah, I remember what Jesus has done. You should live this way. Ah, don't forget what Jesus has done. You should do don't forget Jesus. That's how you are empowered. His spirit living within you to do what you are called to do. And the outcome's brilliant. The outcome is so, so good. Because of the work of Jesus, the old man or the old woman in us has been crucified. And now we have a new life. And what does that mean? It means we're not locked into old destructive patterns. Not locked into selfishness. Unable to love others. But the power of sin and death has been broken. So we have a whole new way of life before us. We're not stuck in these elemental forces of the world. The kingdom of heaven rules and reigns. We don't have to do. We don't have to earn our salvation, which we could never do. It's given to us, and great effort now comes out of our lives because of the salvation he has given us. So not only do we recognize that, Paul wants us to live in light of the future. So here's what he says. He says, when Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. What does this mean? This means that we daily do not recognize who we are and the glory of what it means to be an image bearer, the glory of what it means to be united to Jesus. Paul says our life is hidden with Christ. What, what this means is um, that our life uh, we're, it hasn't been fully revealed. Who we are in him hasn't been fully revealed. We only get little, little glimmers, little inklings of the glory of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And so what this means is that our union with him and our identity with him is, is greater, more expansive than our minds could ever think. The destiny of a human being that's conformed to the image of Jesus the brilliance, the treasure of that is greater than any story that the earthly mind can make up. And on that note, you know, stories serve reality. Fiction serves reality. There is an age-old pattern in the stories that grip human beings that, that points us to this truth, what we're talking about of who we are to be. So you've probably seen this pattern. Let me highlight it a few times. Um, a humble boy, a humble boy lives in a really dysfunctional home, and he lives under the stairs. And one day, on a birthday, a messenger comes to him and changes everything 
And what does he say? Yo, wizardary. Right? Now suddenly this, this orphaned boy knows his identity to some degree and will live out of that and who he is has an incredible destiny and his actions based on that identity will affect history and good will fight evil. How about this one? Another orphaned child. He, this one, he's, he's adopted. Um, commonplace kid. He's a farmhand. He's adopted by some farmers who live on a desert planet that has twin sons. He's a moisture farmer. And his name is Luke. And one day he realizes there is royal blood that runs through his veins. And he's ushered into a galaxy where there are the likes of people like Darth Vader and Yoda and Obi-Wan and the Emperor. Whoa. Okay. A simple earthy hobbit. Your pick. Bilbo or Frodo, right? Is drawn into a grand treasure-dealing adventure of there and back again. And this, this humble little being now has a key part to play in this grand story of ancient shadows and ancient good coming into collision. Or how about four children? Two boys, two girls from a World War II um, bombed, torn apart London, go out to the country, and they are, are magically drawn in through the wardrobe into a magical world where they find out they are not just refugees from bombs and violence. They are the kings and the queens of Narnia in service to Aslan and in service to the emperor across the sea. Why do these stories ring us like bells? Is it simply... Because we want everything to be about us and we want to be the hero? I don't think it's that. I think there's something that hums and churns beneath that. And, and, and it's, it's, it's our hearts that are shaped for eternity resonating with the fact that as image bearers of God, those who are being conformed to the image of Christ, we will radiate with a splendor because of who Jesus is and what he's done, and it's for his glory and our good and the regardening of all creation. That is the end game of what we are a part of. Paul uses the word crypto, hidden. Uh, crypto doesn't just mean, oh shoot, where'd my money go? It disappeared, right? <laughs> crypto means it's hidden and will be revealed. This is why Paul says in 2 Corinthians, Chapter 3, verse 18, he says, And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into the same image, into the likeness of Jesus, from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit, we're being shaped and formed into the image of Christ. And this is why he also says, in Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 19, For I consider that the suffering of this present time the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons, the children of God. This world groans to see who you are in Jesus and to have his glory perfectly reflected and revealed in you. So this is a great commission to live in light of, of who we are becoming because of what Jesus has done, to put off evil and to put on good, to shed the darkness and to don the light. And that's what we're going to do the next two weeks. Next week is going to be a little bit heavier. We're going to see how we are called to shed this darkness and this evil and to repent of those things and then to put on the light. And so this year is starting out with us getting a gospel-shaped imagination. We need our imagination shaped by the gospel. We need to see that Jesus came to do what we never could do and we live out of that good news out of that indicative he's conquered sin and death he's united us to himself and with the spirit now living with us within us we can abide with him with this holy god and we're empowered to obey what he says and we're ultimately going to be changed into his likeness and this is why we've talked about the apprenticeship paradigm over and over and over again it's because as followers of Jesus, we need to know we are united to him by grace and live by grace, abiding with him, obeying him, becoming like him. This is eternal life that begins now. The alternate is sin and death. 
alienated from God, living a life here of hiding from him and hiding who we truly are and hiding from each other because of our guilt and our shame and then living autonomously, making up our own rules about how creation works and then living distorted lives rather than lives that image what's good, beautiful, and true. And so we're going to talk a lot about this this year as we come to know what it means to be united to Jesus. And as I close here, I want to press in on our ordering of things on our ordering of things, of being and and doing, of being loved and doing out of being loved rather than doing and earning in order to be loved. Because I have a a sneaking suspicion that there's a lot of us that that live out a a Christianity that talks about Jesus, that talks about grace, but the, the underlying operating system of our heart is still, Heath, you must do these things in order to be accepted, in order to be loved. If you preach well enough, then then you'll be worth something. If you succeed in what you're doing, then you'll be worth something and you'll be worthy of being loved. And I know these are part of my own fractures, but I I think you feel them and know them too. Like if I if I can get that four point two, or if I can just get that 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 job that that pays this much, or if I could just get that home, or if I could just get that whatever, that that physique, then then I know I'm worth something. If I could just fix all my relationships, then I'll be good enough to to come to God. It's it's not how it works. It's not how it works. Why? Why do you strive so hard? Why do you labor so hard restlessly and and not able to relax on a weekend because you're always trying to find a new life hack to make, make your life better, to get just a little bit further down the road than somebody? Why is it so hard to live in an unhurried way? Why do you obsess so unhealthily about being healthy and, and your appearance? Why do you pursue that dream of, of importance or being an influencer? Are your New Year resolutions just a refresh on earning salvation? Many of us talk about following Jesus, but we have a misordered way of existence. And so my parting shot here is what I'm going to ask you to do. Um, Turn your mind to the Exodus story. If you, Exodus story. If you don't know that, it's, it's okay. But if you do know the Exodus story, um, close your eyes, think about it. You got Moses, Israel, Egypt, the Pharaoh, the plagues, redemption. Okay, you got it loaded in your heads? The Exodus story. Question, one simple question and we'll close. What comes first? The split sea or the law at Sinai? What comes first? A gracious liberation from tyranny and slavery or the call to live a certain way as God's people? What comes first, the split sea or Sinai? The split sea. God draws them out, takes them through what should have been their death, brings them to Sinai and says, live in light of the grace I've showed you. He has always been a God of grace, always drawn us out of death and always called us to live as his light bearers in this world. So my friends, as we start this year, behold again the glory of Jesus. Let the gospel captivate, reshape your imaginations. No, you cannot earn your salvation. He came to save us. He's loved us so that we might love well. So let us think on the things above, peeling off evil, putting on good. Let us have a gospel-shaped imagination and inhabit this world as the citizens of heaven that we are. Ordering is important. May we live gospel-ordered lives. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for who you are. We praise you. We worship you. And and Lord, now we come to this table to confess our need and to be assured by your word and to taste of your grace. So, Father, um, help us to worship you in spirit and in truth in this moment. We love you. Amen.